Good morning. I want to greet you in Christ's name. I want to welcome the visitors we have here this morning and uh, just welcome each one of you to join in in the, in the worship and in the hearing of the Word of God this morning. Um, I've, been, I've been blessed with the devotional this morning, um, the example of Daniel in the lion's den and, and the, the way that God is there for us and he will come through, he will sustain us, he is faithful. I've been thinking a good bit about this, this theme of light and darkness and For just a little bit of a meditation this morning, I'd like to read in Lamentations. Um, Who wrote Lamentations? Can somebody tell me? What's that? Don't think so. It's Jeremiah. Um... I think a lot of times we, um, when we think about coming to church and looking to the Word of God, we are often in this mindset that you know we want we want a word of encouragement, we want to hear good things, and I think sometimes it does us good to look at what happens when people turn away from God and maybe compare and contrast a little bit and just look at our own our own situation as human beings and maybe personalize it to our own our own uh, spiritual condition as an individual each one of us and you know if, if sometimes we're we're discouraged or we're feeling like you know, it's not going well, God is distant, or you know, whatever is going on in our life. And we do a little soul searching. If we're honest with ourselves, we can pretty soon figure out that you know, God didn't move. We're, we're the ones that moved. We allowed a little bit of sin in our life. We allowed a little bit of deception. We allowed um, a little bit of rebellion. And we, like the children of Israel of old, allowed that to be there and thought we could get away with it and thought it would not have, along with it, the darkness and the effects of, of whatever it is that we allowed to come in. So let's read a little bit in Lamentations 1. <clears throat> How doth the city sit solitary that was full of people how is she become as a widow she that was great among the nations and princess among the provinces how is she become tributary she weepeth sore in the night and her tears are on her cheeks among all her lovers she hath none to comfort her all her friends have dealt treacherously with her they are become her enemies Judah is gone into captivity because of affliction and because of great servitude she dwelleth among the heathen She findeth no rest. All her persecutors overtook her between the straits. The ways of Zion do mourn, because none come to the solemn feasts. All her gates are desolate. Her priests sigh. Her virgins are afflicted, and she is in bitterness. Her adversaries are the chief. Her enemies prosper, for the Lord hath afflicted her. For the multitude of her transgressions, her children are gone into captivity before the enemy. And from the daughter of Zion, all her beauty is departed. Her princes are become like hearts that find no pasture, and they are gone without strength before the pursuer. Jerusalem remembered in the days of her affliction and of her miseries all her pleasant things that she had in the days of old, when her people fell into the hand of the enemy, and none did help her. The adversaries saw her and did mock at her Sabbaths. I'm just going to stop there. Um, There's a lot more if you want to get... Um, into reading, and I think it, it's, it can be a blessing. You know, we live in a, in a time when people just don't want to uh, 
think about these things, you know, we should think positive things, you know, you hear that a lot. But I think if we don't, if we don't see the negative that comes with sin, if we don't see the results of rebellion or just simply neglect, then it won't, we won't have a balanced view of the gospel. If we don't see the effects of sin and how it leads to death and damnation and misery, not only in this life, but in the life to come, um, maybe we just, we'll just be blind. And also, if we don't see what we've been delivered from, we won't appreciate the blood of Jesus. And so I just wanted to bring that out this morning um, as an encouragement uh, to all of us that we have been delivered from misery, we've been delivered from death, we've been delivered from darkness, and it is up to us to walk in the light. It is up to us to seek the truth. It is up to us when you come to church on a Sunday morning to prepare our hearts for the truth, to humble ourselves and to acknowledge if there's sin in our lives, to repent of it, turn away from it, and walk in the light. And so, just want to give that as a word of encouragement this morning. Brother Paul is going to be preaching and uh, looking forward to hearing what he has to say. And just pray that our time together here would be blessed. Before we get into the message, I'd like for us to stand. <clears throat> Somebody have a song you'd like to sing. In the hymnary. That's one of my favorites. <clears throat> Arise, my soul. <clears throat> Arise, my soul. Arise, shake off thy guilty fears. Sacrifice in my behalf appears before the throne. My surety stands before the throne. My surety stands. My name is written on his hand. Five bleeding wounds he bears. Received on Calvary. Bless the Lord, all you servants of the Lord, who stand by night in the house of the Lord. Lift up your hands in the holy place and bless the Lord. And bless the Lord. Brother Paul, let's pray. Father, we thank you for your amazing goodness and mercies, your kindness toward us. We thank you for each one that's present here this morning. We thank you for your word and your Holy Spirit. 
We thank you for Brother Paul and being willing to share the word this morning. We pray that you would anoint him with your spirit. Lord, that what he says would, would just motivate us and move us to serve you and follow you and obey you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Greet each one in Christ's name this morning. It's good to see each one of you here. We uh, have a fair amount of visitors here, as been mentioned already. And uh, I've said it many times, this is unique. We will never meet exactly like this again, I can promise you. There's enough of a diversity of people here from different places. And uh, yeah, it's, it's a special service. I don't know if, if you've noticed this has been a little bit of an odd summer. It seems like it can't quit raining. I looked at the 10-day forecast uh, last week, and every single stinking day is rain. Uh, and I looked at it again this morning, and it shows rain just about every day for the next 10 days again. So if you're a concrete guy, it's not exactly what you want to see. But I'm sure there'll be a few days where we can get some work done. The farmers are loving it. Matt's smiling from ear to ear. And uh, so there are people that, that need it, I'm sure. I would like for us to, to I'm going to write a word on, a, on the board here. And... This is, this is the title. I'm going to write the title for the message, I think, here. I don't usually do message or titles. Be ye I think I spelled that right. Okay, can anybody spell that? Can anybody say what that word is? Metamorphos? It's actually metamorphophoe, something like that. Metamorphoe, I think, is actually technically, I think I butchered it there. But there's a, there's a way of saying it that is actually correct. And if you look at that and you say that that looks Greek to me, you're right, because that actually is Greek. It's a Greek word, and we're going to look at that word. Let's open our Bibles to Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 1. There's a few verses here that I'd like to look at as we, we think of this word, this Greek word, metamorpho. I'm going to play that word for you just so you know how to say it because I'm going to butcher it. Strong's G, 3339, metamorpho. Metamorpho. That's how you say it, okay. Something like that. So I'm going to butcher it, but at least you know how it's supposed to sound. Okay, Jeremiah chapter 1. This is, uh, Jeremiah was called as a, as a messenger to God's people. And he, he, he evidently, he felt very inadequate. He felt like he's not qualified. Have you ever been asked to do something? that you didn't really feel like you were qualified to do, something that was intimidating, something that you're scared to death to do. I remember how that felt. I still feel that way very often. I remember as a kid, I remember when it came to, we used to take turns saying our Sunday school verse in church, and I remember being scared to death and laying awake at night thinking, oh no, I gotta say the verse tomorrow in church, not being able to sleep because it scared me so bad. And so I, I know how Jeremiah was feeling. And I also remember when I was ordained, I felt very young. I felt very inadequate. Didn't feel like I, I, I knew the scriptures very well and, and didn't feel like I was qualified then either. And I remember somebody shared this passage with me and that really, really inspired me. In verse 4 of chapter 1, it says, Then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, 
and I will ordain thee a prophet unto the nations. And then said I, Ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak. He says, For I am a child. I felt that way. I'm sure most of you have. Somebody asked me here a while back, Do you get nervous if it's a big crowd? Is the bigger the crowd, do you get nervous? And No, it's not really the case. I get nervous even if it's a small crowd. Last Sunday I was in Greensburg, and there's, you know, it's four or five families there, and it's, I still get nervous. And uh, it doesn't really matter. I still, it's still a little intimidating at times. Anytime you're sharing the word of God especially. He says, Behold, I cannot speak. He says, For I am a child. I'm not qualified. I'm too young. And listen to what God tells him. He says, Say not that I am a child, for thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee. And whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. He says, if you, if you are obedient and you go where I send you, he says, I'm going to put the words in your mouth. You don't need to, to worry. In verse 8 he says, Be not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee to deliver thee, saith the Lord. And then the Lord put, his, put forth his hand and touched my mouth. The Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. So we see what took place here. It was a, a transformation that took place in the life of Jeremiah. He went from one who was, who was scared, who was, who was afraid, who felt like he had nothing to offer. And by simply surrendering his will to, to God, and by being obedient, God was able to use him. And that is really, if you were to sum up the Christian experience... In one word, it has to start with surrender. That is the foundation of, of the Christian life. It has to be built on surrender and obedience. So we see Jeremiah surrendered that thing that he was so intimidated by, that thing he was so scared of, he, he, he surrendered that to, to the Lord, and the Lord was able to use him. And in the end... We know that Jeremiah was used in a, in a mighty way. Well, let's flip forward a few, a few chapters here to chapter 18. Chapter 18, verse 1. It says, The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, He says, Jeremiah says, I want you to go down to the potter's house. He says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have you listen to, to hear my words. And so Jeremiah, he, he showed a pattern, a, a life of, of obedience, and he goes down to the potter's house. You know, he could have argued, you know, what's the point, but he didn't. It says he went down to the potter's house, and it says, Behold, he saw a, or he wrought a work on the wheel. And so the potter is down there, and he's, he's got this, this wheel, and he's, he's making, trying to make a vessel out of clay. It says, the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. It was no good. It was messed up. It had some defects. It was, it was of no value. And it says that so he made it again another vessel as seemed good to the potter to make it. And so the potter, he takes this, this messed up piece of clay, this, this thing that was worth nothing, had no value. He takes it doesn't say that he threw it as far as he could, that he was so disgusted by what he's seen that, that he said, I will never be able to make anything out of this. No, it says that he took that hunk of clay, maybe added a little more water to it, messed with it, got it just the right consistency, and he started making another vessel. One that was useful, one that was beautiful, one that probably was, was worth some money. So we see... Excuse me. We see a, a picture of, of the heart of God, the mercy and the grace of God. The one that, that by man's standards, every one of us should be, be thrown, thrown away and just completely start over from scratch. But no, he takes that same, same hunk of clay and makes something beautiful out of it. Just like... A, a, a framer knows what the finished product is going to look, look like. A farmer knows, expects a certain yield of his crop. A dirt guy knows 
knows exactly which way the water is going to drain when he's done. I believe that God sees the finished product as well. God sees what that, that hunk of, of clay, that marred piece of clay is going to look like when he does his work with him in his life. I believe that's what he sees when he looks at us. Let's, let's turn to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, very familiar chapter. Romans 12, verse 1. He says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren. He says, by the mercies of God. We serve a, a, a gracious and a merciful God. He says, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God. He says, which is your reasonable service. Verse 2, he says, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good an acceptable and perfect will of God. Now this word in verse 2 where it says, Be ye transformed. That is this word right here. Metamorphal. Faal. Foal. Whatever it is. That word, that is the word that, that is used here for being transformed. He says, Be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. <clears throat> that is the same word, or what is the word that, for you young kiddos here, what is the word, <coughs> you've seen this fuzzy little caterpillar, beautiful little thing, right? And then you've seen that transformation that takes place when he, he goes through that thing and he suddenly becomes a butterfly. What do you call that? Any of you kiddos? Metamorphosis. Metamorphosis, that's it. Good job. That is the same word that we're talking about here. That is, it goes back to the Greek word. And that literally means to change into another form. So we, we read this verse in, in chapter 12 of Romans here. He says, To be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed. We are going to take on a different shape, a different form from what we previously were. We can look in Matthew chapter 17 and we know how that Christ, he went up on the mountain, of the mountain of transfiguration, and it says that he, he changed, his, the, his face changed, and even his clothing was changed. And that was the same word is used in that, in that verse, where it talks about being transfigured. And this transformation is it's something that, that we allow by surrendering our will to God, it is something that, that we allow to be done to us. We have to give up our own will and let Christ do it. It's not something that we ourselves can do. We cannot transform ourselves. Just like that, that little fuzzy butterfly or, or caterpillar, it doesn't, it doesn't force itself into being a butterfly. It's actually, it has to first surrender well, let's surrender its will. But it, it does what its creator has created it to do. <coughs> Excuse me. Scripture tells us that if we are in Christ, if we are in Christ, Christ is in us, it says that we are a new creature. We are a new creature in Christ. And so what's the point, right? Like, what is the point of, of this transformation? We know that in verse 2 here it says that we are to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. By default, if we are not transformed, we will be conformed to this world. That is a reality. Excuse me, losing my voice here. So the goal of transformation is to become like Christ. That should be, that is the goal. That is the ultimate goal. 
Let's turn our Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. I think we had this verse, maybe it was in our Sunday school lesson last week, I believe it was. It says, But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, we are changed. There again, that is, in the Greek text, that same word, that metamorphosis that took place. We shall be changed in the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. That is a work of Christ in our life. <clears throat> and so the goal is, is to be transformed just like Christ, into the image of Christ. And the Scripture gives us a promise. It says that we will be changed. We are changed into that same image from glory to glory. And it is a work, it's a supernatural work that takes place in the life of the believer. Let's look at Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, verse 29. He says here, for, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed. Again, that same word, that same word there, the, uh, the metamorphosis, to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. And so we were predestined to look like Christ, to be an image bearer of Christ, to be Im an imitator of Christ. The early church, the reason that we are called Christians today is because that literally means little Christ. And people would see these Christians coming along, and these were followers of, of Christ. And they would say, hey, here come those, those little Christ. They're trying to be like their master. That should be the goal of, of all believers today. Let's look at Luke. Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6, verse 40. This is a, a beautiful verse to me. It says, the, the disciple is not above his master, but everyone that is perfect shall be as his master. I like the way that the New King James Version says it. It says, a disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone who is perfectly trained will be like his teacher. I love that. That as we surrender to, to the Lordship of Christ, and as we follow in his footsteps, and as we, we day by day we walk with him, we become more like him. We become more sanctified. We become more, more like the master. And it says that who, whoever is perfectly trained said he's going to be like his teacher. Just like a young son, a young daughter. So often they, they grow up and, and they have the same character traits as their parents do, oftentimes, because they have seen the influence or they have been under that influence and that they become very much like the ones they pattern their life after. Okay, so the first, the first goal of this metamorphosis that takes place is to become like Christ. The second one that I have here is to live like Christ. So it would be a, a dictator, a cruel dictator that would call people to a, to a certain standard of living. He says to live, that we should... Uh, that we should present our bodies a living sacrifice, holy. He calls us to this level of, of obedience. And it would be a cruel dictator that would call you to that level of, of obedience and not give you any help in attaining that level of, of obedience. He calls us to live like Christ. Ephesians chapter 5, a few verses here. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. It says, Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children. Walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. He says that we are to walk in love. We are to imitate the life of Christ. 
the love that Christ had for mankind, we also should, should have that same level of, of love. As difficult as it is, it's a supernatural work that takes place in the life of a believer. So we are to walk as he walked. So the question is, how is that possible? He calls us, he calls us to this, and we, and we understand that there's a transformation that, that should be taking place in our life. And I believe that, that it is in the world that we live in today, especially for young people and old people alike. I'm not going to dismiss that. But there's, we're under so much influence, especially with, with social media, with with all that's out there, that we're under a huge influence. And so how do, we, how do we know what is true? How do we know that some of the people that we're allowing into our life to speak into our life, how do we know that what they are teaching or, or saying is actually true? We can't go by just what they say because people have ulterior motives. And sometimes... Oftentimes, there's a lot of, of deceit involved in some of the things that we're listening to. So how do we know? How can we differentiate between what is good and what is deceptive? Let's look at Colossians. Colossians chapter 3. I know we're jumping around a lot of scriptures here. Colossians chapter 3, verse 1, it says, If ye then... Be risen with Christ. He says, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. He says, set your affection on things above and not on things on the earth. And so number one, we, we must have a, a heavenly perspective, an eternal perspective. If our focus is strictly on the here and now, We will be conformed to this world because that is how the world lives. And the world's, the world's motivation is, is all about let's, let's amass as much as I can for myself here, instant gratification, and live my best life now. That is the world's motivation. Go have your fun. What the world does not tell you is that all of those things... They will all lead to the same place. And that is depression, helplessness, hopelessness, and eventually it leads to death. That's a fact. And so we, we must have that, that eternal perspective, focusing on eternal things. Romans chapter 8. Romans 8, verse 5. He says here, For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit the things of the Spirit. And so when our focus is, is on fleshly things, that tells us that there's a heart problem. That tells us that, that we're... We're dealing with the old man. But when our, our appetite is for spiritual things, that is, that is a good thing. That's what we ought to be thirsting for. And that is, is also a, a work of Christ in our life. I know that as, as a young Christian, 16, 17 years old, I know that that my, my level of thirst and hunger wasn't as high as it should have been. And so I, I completely understand. I think that it's, it's unrealistic for us as maybe older, more mature Christians to expect the same level of surrender from our young people as we do 
from the old people. Maybe not surrender. Surrender is not the right word. We should all have the same level of surrender, but the same level of, of spirituality, perhaps. I think of... I think of... Uh, I, I like deer hunting, okay? I love deer hunting. And so yesterday I went out and I, I had a couple cameras and I, I dumped some corn out and I'm trying to get pictures of a big deer to go after. And so I've got a couple years of history now with, with some of these, these deer over there and, and it's, it's nice when you see a deer that you had some history with show up on camera and you can kind of predict how old they are and that's a lot of fun for you deer hunters. You know what I'm talking about. But I, I also know that that if all, I, if, if all that I shoot or harvest are young deer, I'm never going to be able to harvest that big 170-inch deer, right? Probably never do it anyway. But. And so I know that in order for a deer to express his full potential, antler-wise, he's going to have to be, what, five and a half years old, right? And so the goal is to get some, some big antlers, right? Because we like to brag about it with our buddies humbly. And, uh, but that's the goal. We get that. I think spiritually it's, it's the same way. We should understand that some of these are just two and a half year olds <laughs> or three and a half year olds. They're young in the faith. And they're probably not going to express the same level of maturity as what the older ones are going to express. So we need to be gracious. We need to give them a pass every now and then. But we also need to be that example. That example of, of surrender, that example of obedience. We need to be filling our mind and feeding our mind on the word of God. There's a lot of counterfeits out there. And there's a lot of people who will take one verse or two verses and, and build a, a complete doctrine or theology, more of a theology on, on those few verses. We need to know what it says in context. We need to be feeding on the Word of God. The Word of God is, is, is Him speaking to us. Prayer is good, prayer is necessary. It's a vital part of the believer's journey. We must be praying people as well. But the word of God is him speaking directly to his people. We dare not forget that. And I will confess, that is an area that I am, I am weak in. It, it gets, it, it's easy to, to push it off and to think I'll do it later. And eventually you become very dry that's been my experience we will become what we think I think it's Paul Washer that says that whatever you think on the most if you can tell me what you think on the most I can tell you what your God is that's pretty scary What is it that fills my mind most of the time? What is it that fills your mind most of the time? And if that is true, our minds should be filled mostly with spiritual things. We will become what we think. The battle begins, I believe, in the mind. That is where my battle begins. Why do so many Christians remain caterpillars? Why do you think that is? Why do you think there's so many that they, they look cute, they're fuzzy, they're, they're cuddly, but they're not really doing what they were created to do? Were they ever regenerated to begin with? Were they ever really born again? Why did they not ever really go through that metamorphosis stage 
where they, they were transformed into something spectacular. And there's a lot of people that are perfectly content with just being a little fuzzy worm. And they really have no desire to be a butterfly and to fly and to do what they were created to do. They're perfectly content. So why is that? They have the same promise that we have, that I have, that you have. We all have the same promise. The promise of a changed life as evidence of the Spirit of God living within them. They have the same promise. I'll say I believe that the real problem is a lack of renewing of the mind. A lack of daily getting into the Word of God. Getting to know the character of God through His Word and also just walking with Him and having an intimate relationship with Him. We consume all of these, this stuff. We turn the radio on and we can listen to this and listen to that, change stations. We have our playlist. We have our, our social media. We have all of our friends, our Snapchat, our whatever it is. All of these things. And we're consuming. We're, we're consumers, big time consumers. We're taking all of this in and we expect it's not going to change us. That it's not going to affect us. It's not going to change how we process things. <laughs> Meanwhile, your spirit is starving to death. It's literally starving, shriveling up. And eventually, it's like it dies. Our great physician, he's a miracle worker. I'm amazed at how how the medical profession can do things. My dad had some stents put in his heart. And they went up through an artery in his leg, right? Your wrist, okay. How can they do that? It makes no sense to me. How can they figure out, turn left here and right there? I don't get that. Like, how, how do they do that? That's amazing, though. How do they get a stent up here by going in here? It just doesn't make sense. They can do such amazing things. But our great physician, he can do even greater things. He can take that, that heart of stone and change that into a heart of flesh. He can take that person who was, who was laying drunk in the gutter and transform that person's mind. And where this person, all he wants to think about and all he wants to consume is God and, and his mercy. And that's all he wants. That's what his appetite is for. He wants to perform a brain surgery on each one of us. He wants to renew our mind, and he will renew our mind. Question for all of us, and this is a, a serious question. Just like Jeremiah went down and he seen that, that hunk of clay... That was of no value. But he's seen how the, the potter took that, that hunk of clay and made a useful vessel out of it. I don't know what happened to that vessel. It doesn't say. That's not the point. But I believe that that vessel was very useful. I believe it was beautiful. Are we going to allow that same potter to put us on the wheel... To shake our world up a little bit, it's going to hurt. It's probably not going to be a real pleasant process. We have to lose our own identity. And we take on the identity that Christ has for us. But in that identity, or in that, that transformation, that metamorphosis, or the Greek word that I keep butchering, and I was sure I had it down pat when I left the house this morning. I listened to it over and over. 
But that transformation that takes place turns that hunk of clay into a very valuable piece. Something that is useful. Something that actually turns out looking just like the one who made it. It's a miracle what happens. We serve a gracious God, a merciful God. And he is in the business of transforming lives. I know there's a lot of there's a lot of people who go through life who are very depressed and very discouraged and maybe you're there this morning. You feel like your life is is a failure. Maybe you feel like you have nothing to offer. I want to tell you that God is a very much interested in your life and he loves delivering his people. Just like we talked about in our Sunday school lesson this morning, Jonah, of all people, he, he thought he was going to commit suicide and die. That's what his plan was. He's just going to jump off the boat, just throw me overboard, get rid of me. Then I won't have to go do this thing that I don't want to do. But God in his mercy, he swallows him up with this, this big fish, this whale. And after a few days, finally Jonah comes to his senses. I think that the first few days sitting in that that the belly of that fish, I think he was still in rebellion. And eventually he comes to his senses, sort of, because we know how the story of Jonah goes. And then Jonah, after he goes and he preaches to the people of Nineveh, what happens? Eventually they all repent, and he's sitting there, and he's, now he's upset. Why? I wanted you to destroy these people. I don't know how the story of Jonah ends. But if he would surrender his life completely, I know that God did a work of transformation in it. Completely. I hope this is an encouragement to you. We serve a, a good father. And so often it feels like the preaching of the word can be kind of foolish. But at the end of the day... We are called to point people back to Christ and to just remind us of who God is, of his holiness, and the joy that it is in being a child of God and a joy, the joy that it is in being surrendered to him. I've not always found it easy to surrender, but I've always found that there's, there's such blessing in being able to throw my hands up and say, I can't do this anymore on my own. I'm going to let you do this. That's, a, that's where I want to be. That's where I want to continue to be. Let's bow our heads and pray. Father, I thank you for the privilege of being here again this morning. Thank you for each one that's here. I pray, God, that you would continue that work of transformation in our lives. Father, I pray that, that as we, we face life and as we, we go through different experiences, Lord, that that work would be evident, that it would speak to the lost world around us. Lord, they need... They need to see an example of you through us. And so, God, that's a high calling. We know it is, but we're, we also know that, that you have called us to that. And so you're going to enable us in the moment. So we're going to walk by faith. We're going to believe that you will do that work in us and continue to do it until you call us home. We thank you, Lord, for your grace and for your mercy. I pray, Lord, that you would just go with us the rest of this day. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let's have a song, please. Number 49 in the hymnal.
Thank you, Brother Paul, for sharing that. It was a great blessing. I think um, this, this thing of etamorpho, or however you pronounce it, somebody has said that um, salvation, conversion, is it's kind of a three, has three aspects to it. One is when we're born again, we pass from death into life. And the other is, as we are living the Christian life, we are continually being changed. And as God shows us areas in our life that need to be transformed, and we submit to the process, then we experience growth, we experience change. And the third aspect is when we stand before God and we are received as his sons and daughters. And so the, the idea was we're saved and we're being saved and we will be saved. I think that's good theology. And I think that is, um, you know, there's a lot of variety in the way that God deals with us because we're different. We're so different. And I think it's something that God has designed. He likes variety. But I really appreciated the aspects of um, surrender and just what Paul brought out and the fact that we can trust God we can trust the we can trust the plan that he has for us we can we can surrender to him we can be safe with him we don't have to keep fighting and debating and wandering and living in fear if we surrender it all so I'd like to open it up if you have something you'd like to share Another thing I thought that was really good, um, or just really stuck with me, was this idea that we, I think from the beginning of time, since the fall, we engage in self-deception in where we somehow convince ourselves that we can do something that's contrary to the will of God, that we know is disobedience to God, that we can do that and get away with it. It's probably, I mean, it's, it's the main deception that we engage in. Um, you know, when Eve came, or when the serpent came to Eve and said, Yea, hath God said. It's just an invitation to, it's just kind of a dare. You, you're special. You can get away with this. The rest of the people can't, but you're, you're going to be able to get away with this. And it's a lie. And it, over and over, proves to be true in our lives. And... When he said, um, we end up alone and fearful and desperate and miserable. It's exactly where we end up. I'm working with an individual right now that is a living illustration of that. Anybody, anyone else? Yes.
Eddie, did you want, want to say something? So it's reasonable and logical and rational. It's interesting that even secular uh, psychologists, I guess, will come to the same conclusion that there are certain laws you just can't violate and get away with, with violating them. And uh, I think there's, we live in a world that is just bent on proving that you can somehow get, you know, break God's laws and get away with it. It's just amazing. Anyway. Anyone else? Thank you, Roger. Anyone else? Okay. Are there any announcements before we close the service? We all serve tonight and tomorrow. What time? 620. Okay. Anyone else? All right, let's stand. Brother Paul will dismiss us. Let's sing Alive, Alive as we dismiss. Alive, alive, alive.